we go. Can you guys see my slides? Okay. All righty. So here's some things that we're going to be talking about today. There are things that we absolutely have control over. And then there are some things in business or lots of things in business that we have no control over at all, right? And so today we're going to be talking and focusing on the things that we have control over, obviously. Now, before I begin, I wanted to share some stats with you guys, okay? This is the whole U.S. stats of transactions that have happened. So in 2021, right, right when the, the thick of the pandemic, when the, the world seemed like it came to a screeching halt, and then, and then afterwards, like, it just started going crazy, there were 6.1 million transactions that took place in the U.S. In 2022, that number went down to 5 million. Who remembers last year? It was it was a fun time, wasn't it? Um, we had a lot of uncertainty. Rates started shooting up like crazy, and of course, because of that, the demand for buyers or for homes reduced significantly. In 2023, they're anticipating that the number of transactions, the volume of transactions that take place, actually goes down to four million transactions. Now, the cool thing is, is that in 2021 there was 1.6 million agents nationwide. These are rough estimates, right? Give or take one or a thousand. Um, in 2023, that number went down to 1.2 million agents. So if you were to add those numbers or you know, divide those numbers, you'd say that the average agent had the capacity or did four transactions, or there's four transactions per agent that was licensed in the US in 2021. And in 2023, that number is now down to three, which is a 25% decrease in the volume, right? Now, obviously, we all know that that's not the case, that, you know, your overall volume isn't going to be the same just because you've got the 80-20 rule that applies, right? You guys all know what the 80-20 rule is, right? You have 80% of the people do 20% of the work, and you've got 20% of the people that do 80% of the work. And so that being said, if you were to look at the, the true numbers of the volume down, we've had a reduction in volume by 34.4% in the from, from 2021 to now, 34.4%. So I'm gonna ask this question to you. Um, if you had your income be reduced by 34% this year, would that be okay with you? If you had your income reduced by 34%, as an agent, right? If you were making $100,000 before and now you're making $6,600 or $66,000, would that be okay? And if you need to do that number by, by the month, then that's fine, you can do it. But the point I'm making is that that reduction in overall income is going to have a lot of impact on every single one of us as agents. <clears throat> so what do we need to do? Like, again, we, as I talked about, there are things that you can't control. You can't control what happens with interest rates. You cannot control what happens with the amount of transactions that happen. You can't control buyer demand, right? That Those are going to be dictated by external forces. But you as an agent, what you can control are certain things. And that's what I want to focus on today. And here's a couple of things. I wanted to start off by saying you've got control of your mindset. Now, what are you feeding your mindset, right? Are you the person that watches the news morning and evening, right? Or listens to it or, or, you know, listens to podcasts that are about the news and what's going on in world events? Or are you listening to uplifting and inspirational podcasts, right? Things that give you tactical approaches, give you business ideas, give you ideas in which you can increase your mindset to be able to be positive and have a, an abundance mindset. Where are you with that? Or are you listening to just music? right? I love music. Don't get me wrong. I listen to it all the time. What I've realized, the difference between listening to music and listening to uplifting and podcasts and, and just, you know, strategy-based information that I either consume through um, YouTube or con consume through podcasts, that my mindset changes significantly, right? When I listen to music, and sometimes I'll listen to like, even if it's inspiration or classical music, it's good, but it's not it's, it's not feeding my brain as much as would if I was actually consuming content. So working on your mindset in this environment is huge because guess what? That number of 4 million transactions that they're anticipating selling this year is very similar to how it was back in 2008. Okay, most of you guys have not been around. 
in 2008. You guys weren't selling real estate. You might've been born, right? You may have been an adult. Some of you guys are young enough. You might've been in diapers or whatever, but for the most part, most people during that era, like it was bad. If you were an agent back then, it was rough. It was absolutely rough. And so that's what they anticipate happening this year. And a lot of agents in their mind, when they're going through that, right? When they're going through like, oh my gosh, like, you know, transactions are not just naturally falling in my lap. Like I'm going to have to actually do something about it. That was a huge shift in mindset. And a lot of people freaked out. And frankly, a lot of people left the industry, which they've already started to do. And so working on your mindset, you guys might seem trivial or might seem like it's not a big deal, but it absolutely is. It is absolutely critical that you work on your, your mindset. Number two is your body. What are you feeding it, right? Are you numbing the pain by drinking alcohol and by doing drugs, whatever type of drugs that is, to be able to relieve the stress and the, the, the anxiety that you feel? Are you eating overeating with food or eating a whole bunch of sugar to be able to numb the pain and the stress and the anxiety? Or are you eating healthy foods and are you exercising? And, then, and is that a part of your regular daily routine? Now, I'm speaking to all of you guys, right? I'm looking right in the camera here. I want you to be able to have the highest probability and the best chance of success in 2023, and not just in business, but just overall life. And I promise you that these two things right here are critical to get a foundation set so you can actually excel in this life or excel in business and in your, in your personal life. Okay, so if that's not, if you are numbing the pain, I'm not saying if you have an occasional drink, I'm not talking about that, but if you're every single day, get home and you have to have your, your, your you know, glass of wine or in the morning or whatever it is, if, if that's how you cope with your stress and anxiety, like I promise you that, that you think that you're doing something good, but it's actually impacting your life more than you can possibly know. Because that, by doing that, by numbing yourself, either through food or alcohol or drugs, those things make you have no desire for growth, right? You just kind of, you just become numb and lethargic and you don't have any desire to do anything, right? You're just kind of just there. The third thing that I want to, things that we can focus on is our knowledge, right? What info are we studying? Okay. Are we studying music lyrics? Are we studying music quote or movie quotes? And, and you know, do we have that knowledge in our head? Um, sports games and stats, like, is that what's like occupies your mind? Or are you looking at market trends, conditions? Are you looking at inventory, both online and in person? Are you looking at the interest rates and seeing the trend and what's happening? Do you guys realize that last month when rates went from like seven to 6%, that there's a surge of buyers that came out? Do you guys remember that? Do you guys experience any of that? Yeah, like it happened. Guess what happened though? Rates are back, are back up to seven, right? Like you can't control that. But what you can control is your mindset. You can control your body. You can control what information you put into it. Because guess what happens? When you feed your mind and you, and you educate yourself with information, then you become that expert knowledge that people are looking for. You guys, in this world and in, in, in the age that we live in, where there is so much information on Google, right? And with even like chat GDP now and all these other AI stuff that's coming out, like people have information at their disposal, at their fingertips so quickly. But here's what also happens with that information. If you have all that info, but it's, but you need someone to be able to explain it to you. You need someone to be able to articulate it to you, right? Every single one of us, we had a, a medical condition or if we had um, you know, an issue where we're being sued or, you know, we, we needed an attorney guess what? We can look online that all the information's there, right? All the medical journals are there for our availability, right? To be able to view and read, but we still want that person to say, Hey, help me make sense of this data. Help me make sense of all this. How do I use these laws that are available here to be able to protect me or help me accomplish my goal? And so even though most agents have succumbed themselves or even think in their mind that all they've become are just door openers, that that's the only value that represent is that they've got a lot, the super on their phone so they can check or and open the lockbox and let people in. If that's the only value you think you bring and that's the only value they think you have, guess what's going to happen to your commission? Or guess what's going to happen to you, right? You're going to become non-existent. But if you control that, that narrative, you control that data that's there and you say, 
I'm going to read this data. I'm going to watch these things. I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to look at the inventory. I'm actually physically see the houses that are available for sale as I preview them. By doing those things every single day, what's that going to do to you? It's going to educate you so that when someone comes to you as a seller, let's say you know a seller walks into your open house or a buyer walks into your open house. You guys, please correct me if I'm wrong. But if a buyer walks into your open house and they're looking, you know, call it an, an $800,000 price range or 400, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? If they're looking in a specific price range. Do you think that they know every single home that's available in their price range in, that, in the area? What do you guys think? Do they know yet? Raise your hand. Or if they don't know, keep your hand down. Do they know? They absolutely effing lutely know. They know what is available. They don't need you to tell them that. But guess what? If they know what's available, but you don't, then you're an idiot. You, you're not relevant to them. You have no value that you can offer them. Is that true? You guys, like if you know the inventory and they come up to your open house because that's one of the houses that they're looking at seeing, and that home is in the eight hundred thousand dollar range, and they say, "Oh yeah," like, and then if you say, "Oh cool," like, have you seen the house on, you know, yada yada street? And they're like, "Yeah, actually, we, we've either been to it, or we are planning on seeing it, or yeah, we're actually curious about it." Right? They know, and so when you speak in an educated way by saying, "Oh yeah, do you know about that home?" and then you go further and you say, "I've actually been inside that house, and that home actually is." better, worse, or equal to this house here. Oh, and there's this really cool feature about this house. And then you tell them about the home and they haven't seen it yet. And you've got that knowledge and you provide that to them, you guys, that's when you create value for those agents or for those buyers. Same thing with sellers, right? Sellers know if they're getting, if a, if a look lube uh, neighbors coming to your open house, they are investigating that home and they're also investigating you as an agent. And so if they're investigating you as an agent, they want to know how knowledgeable you are. How well do you rep represent that home, right? How well do you represent yourself and compose yourself? How much knowledge do you have? Are you the right fit? Do they even like you, right? So that they're, they're kind of feeling you out. And if they come up to you and like, oh yeah, well, my neighbor just sold their house, you know, six months ago for whatever price. And you don't know because you haven't done the research because it literally would take you five minutes before you do the open house to get that info, but you didn't do it. And they're like, oh, yeah. And that's all you can say. They automatically shut down. I don't know if you guys have you've seen this before or not. But when people realize that you have no value to them, they just shut you down. They dismiss you. They might be pleasant to you, right? Especially from if you're in an area where people are nicer generally. California is not the case. But other parts of the country, people are nicer. They'll be nice to your face. But then after that, you're never going to be able to have contact with them. Because you'll be like, oh, yeah, that 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 so-and-so doesn't know their lease squad and I'm not going to waste my time. It's just like that example I've given you guys in the past where if I walk into a grocery store, if I go to Home Depot and I'm like, I, I don't have time to search the, the 40,000 square foot warehouse space for something. I'm just looking for one part or one thing. And I go to a person, I say, hey, I'm looking for this one thing. And if they have that stare on their face, like, uh, I don't know, then I automatically dismiss them. I'm like, okay, you're wasting my time. I'd rather you know, either I'm going to find someone else that knows, or I'm just going to walk down the aisles and find it myself, right? And so to be able to not have that dismissal happen, you need to have that knowledge. You need to educate yourself. I'm not saying don't go watch movies. I'm not saying that don't waste your time and have fun with whatever, listen to music, all that's great, right? You know, but our, our capacity in our brain is so much more that if you're not at least giving yourself that knowledge and that wisdom to know exactly what's happening in your marketplace. And you guys, with the tools that we have, it is so easy, isn't it? It's all there for us. Like, it's so simple. Every single morning you wake up and you pull up the hot sheet of every single home that hit the market in that neighborhood or in that community or the city or whatever it is, then set yourself a time to go see it, right? What I love about the Robert Mack group is that every single Friday they wake up and they have broker preview and they go preview all these really nice homes, right? That's their marketplace. And what does that do for them? Yes, it allows them to network, but it allows them to get to know the inventory. And then so when they have a client that says, oh yeah, I'm looking for a home for, you know, 7.8 million. They're like, oh yeah, actually there's this house that I saw last week 
that would be an amazing fit for you based on what, you, what you've told me. Let's go take a look at it again. And he can speak educatedly because of that, because he's seen the property. He's, he's given himself knowledge. And he also knows when he shows a home, right? If you're going to show a property, are you getting all the sold data in that neighborhood? And you might say, well, Nazara, I'll do that after if they like the house or not. It's not for that reason. It's that when you know that information, which would literally take you a very short amount, amount of time, and then, then you go show them that house and you say, oh, yeah, well, a home like this down the street sold for this, right? And let, let's, you know, obviously the, the values have come down a little bit. So if you say that home down the street sold for $900,000, which is exactly the same floor plan as this, and this home is nicer and it's listed for eight seventy five. You guys, when you tell them that, like it draws that buyer to you even more. It makes them loyal to you because they know that you have information that they may be able to find online, but you have it, Johnny, on the spot. You, you know. Same thing with schools, right? Like, do you know what schools that home belongs to? Now, they might be able to know, right? But you can say, hey, you know, this particular house belongs to, you know, Claire Barton Elementary School, which is a not a year-round school, and you can rattle off all this information about that particular elementary school because you know because you see they've got a ten-year-old there that you know most likely would be going there, and you could have that conversation with them. Knowledge is power, and I invite every single one of you to gain more knowledge. I know you guys don't do it enough. I know it's not something that is a normal part of your routine. I invite it to be a normal part of your routine. Just the same as you wake up in the morning and you have your cup of coffee or you have your cereal or whatever you eat. And just like how most times, most people don't miss a meal, right? Like gain that hunger for knowledge. And I promise you that as you continue to feed your, your, your mind with knowledge of data and stats and, and information, that will serve you immensely well, okay? Okay, um, so hold on, talk about three, okay, number four, 10 new contacts a day. Like this is so basic and fundamental, but it is also something that is extremely hard to do and people don't do it. If you can talk to 10 new people every single day about real estate, then independent of market conditions, independent of demand that's out there, you will naturally accomplish your goal that you have. You'll just naturally accomplish your goal that you have. And I invite you to take that challenge on, that challenge on that I'm giving you right now. Like do that That's for energy. Do it for one week. Get yourself, make yourself make those 10 contacts. Talk to fresh 10 new people. I'm not talking about people that you, you've known in the past. And, and if it is something you've known in the past, but as long as you haven't talked to them for three months, it counts. It, it's it. I, I, I'll, I'll allow that, but talk to ten people, right? And even if you work five days a week, that's fifty new people that you get to talk to every single week. And ideally, in some way or show, you know, one way or another, either get those people already in your database or get them in your database if they have any desire to make a move or just want to know. And you guys, most people love talking about real estate, don't they? Right? It's an easy conversation to have, and so. When you talk to them, find out if they're a buyer, seller, or an investor. And if they are, they might not be this moment, right? But someone owns a home, they're eventually going to be a seller, inevitably, at some point, right? There's going to be some life event that happens that is going to cause them to want to make a move. And so get them and put them on HomeBot. Put them on whatever system that you have that allows you to be able to send monthly updates of what their house value is at. If they're a buyer and they're not looking to buy for another three years, that's fine. But set them up on a search so that on a daily basis or at least on a minimum weekly, they're getting listings from you. And then they are part of your CRM system and that you get to follow up with them once a quarter or whenever it is to see if their change or the time frames has changed in their lives or not. If they're an investor, same thing. Send those listings of investment opportunities that come along. If they're a particular investor, and set yourself a reminder to be able to check on a weekly basis so you're not sending them just crap where you're looking through some of the listings, right? Because you already are previewing property. And if anything falls in line with what they're looking for as an investment, send it to them, right? It, it, it's, it's that easy, but make those 10 contacts a day. And if you do that in the morning, then I don't care if you do nothing else for the rest of the day, if you're not productive, by just doing those 10 contacts every single day, you'll naturally 
have appointments with buyers and sellers and investors that you won't be able to, you'll have so much business, you won't know what to, what to do with it. And you'll need help to be able to manage that. I promise you, take me up on it. Number five, role play, practice. Um, we've got a little bit of time. I'm gonna show you this really cool video. Um, hopefully, let's see if I can stop sharing, pull that up, do this. Okay, I'm gonna share this video. This has nothing to do with our industry. Okay, this is this is the lady that that plays the piano, but she talks about practice and role plays virtually the same thing. And I want you guys to listen to it. Okay, here we go. Hopefully you guys have audio on, and hopefully this audio works. I decided that I wanted to. Can talk you guys hear? Give me a thumbs up. Ordinary thing in my life, okay. which is practice. I did a little bit of estimating, and in my lifetime, I've spent six thousand four hundred and forty hours, approximately, on the bench practicing. Now we've all been told at some point in our life, practice makes perfect. Well, I am here tonight to burst the bubble. That's not true. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And tonight I want to share with you my three-step process to perfect practice. Now as a quick disclaimer, I know that perfect is kind of an intimidating word. Um, I like to think of the Russian figure skater Yevgeny Plachenko who after he withdrew from the Winter Olympics, said in an interview in broken English, I'm not robot. I'm not suggesting that we should try to become perfect robots, just that we should strive for the highest level of excellence that we can possibly achieve. That just doesn't roll off the tongue quite as nicely as perfect practice makes perfect. So the first step in this process is consistency. Um, I had a lesson, a piano lesson during my freshman year it was really discouraging for me. I felt like I was making a lot of mistakes and I was just not really getting to where I needed to be. And I sat down with my teacher and said, I'm so discouraged. I feel like I'm doing so badly. And he said, you just need to increase your sitting power. I was like, sitting power? And um, he basically said, sitting power is you're on the right track, you're doing the right thing, but you're not doing them enough. When we develop sitting power, we develop the patience and the perseverance to sit down and work at something. Now, as another aside, I recognize that most of this audience is not gonna go home tomorrow and practice a musical instrument. I know I'm in the minority. Um, however, this applies to anything that we do in our lives that's commonplace or ordinary. And when we rethink the way we do ordinary things, like me practicing, our results become extraordinary. So, sitting power. I did a little bit more calculation. In the past year, I've spent 828 hours at the piano practicing. The bare minimum practice requirement for music performance major at BYU-Idaho is three hours a day, six days a week. Now, admittedly, I am a millennial and we like our information short and to the point we are notorious for our lack of investment and our penchant for getting bored easily and not investing in things. However, excellence was never achieved within the length of a tweet. And this is why I think sitting power is so important. When we are able to do things that we don't feel like doing, sit down and put in the work and put in the time, that's when we're able to get more work done. So the next thing is evaluation. Sitting power by itself is not enough. I could sit at the piano for eight hours a day. And if I was practicing mistakes, it would actually be doing more harm than it does good. My teacher, I refer to him affectionately as a crazed perfectionist. Um, at his most picky, I once spent an entire lesson on the same three chords. I would play them for you, but I don't want to step down and step back up. It's a little precarious up here. Um, I, I will never forget those three chords. It was a, it was a hard lesson. <laughs> um, but this is where perfection and striving for perfection in my practice really comes into play is in this evaluation step. I could sit down every day, and if I played from end to end my piece, inevitably made a few mistakes, then patted myself on the back for you know, getting 80% of it right, and then did it over and over and over again until I met my allotted three hours a day that's required for me to get course credit, that would never really benefit me at all. Um, instead, you have to split your activities up. So there is stuff that I know is good, stuff that I can do. And I put that in the, I don't need to practice this as much box. Then there is also stuff that's not so good. And in this 
step of evaluation, I ask myself two questions. The first is, was that perfect? Now there's that word again, but essentially was that right? Was it correct? Did I play what the composer intended? This can apply to any of us. You know, did I get the answer right on this test? Did I do this task that I was given correctly? If the answer is yes, the next question you asked yourself was, was that easy? Did I get lucky? Was I white knuckling it around the corner? Or did I actually do it well and it was natural for me, it was easy? Now, if the answer to both those questions is yes, you can take that thing that you're doing and put it in the, I don't need to work on this so hard box. However, if the answer is no, that leads us, which it often is, that leads us to the last step of the process, which is repetition. Now, when I was young, my teacher would give me what she called skill spots. She would go to the music and she would pick a measure or a small section that she knew was tricky or challenging. And she would put a little smiley face star sticker on it and then send me home to do repetitions. Her required number, my age. So five repetitions was not a problem. 12 repetitions I can handle. 16 repetitions, you know, whatever. It's not that many. I've gotten to the point in my life where 21 repetitions doesn't cut it anymore. And so I developed a system that makes me kind of accountable for my repetitions. And this is just a scan that I took of um, one of my pieces. And you can see these numbers on the side. Um, I have basically divided every single piece of music that I play into, you know, 50 or 60 skill spots. It's just that I use the whole piece now instead of just a little small part of it like my teacher used to. Then once I've done this, I know this is a little bit small, but I make a spreadsheet and across the top you have the dates and across the bottom the sections. And I go through and the number of repetitions that I do, I keep track of it. So if I was playing something 50 times a day incorrectly, I'd be enforcing a bad habit. However, when I play something multiple times a week, 45 or 50 times a day, I'm playing it right. I'm building, in my personal case, a tactile foundation. I'm training my mes muscle memory how it feels to do something right. So when I get in a situation where I'm nervous or when I'm playing faster or if I have a memory slip, I can fall back on this tactile foundation that I've built and I know how to do something right. Now let's apply this to an athlete, someone who skis does not think about every little anatomical shift that they have to make in order to execute a turn. They just do it because it's natural. So essentially, whatever it is that you're doing every day, rethink it. Get in touch with your inner crazed perfectionist, like my teacher. Increase your sitting power and work a little bit harder and train your instincts to do something excellent. Just remember that in everything that you do, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Thank you. All right. You guys, um, I hope that you got a chance to be able to really understand how this applies to us. Obviously, it's a completely different thing, right? She's she's an in instrument or, or a piano player. But what, what are some takeaways that you got from that? What are some things that you're like, oh, shoot, that actually would be amazing. And how, how much do we fall short in doing that? Like actually looking at our business with a, mag, uh, a magnifying glass and saying, what am I doing right? What is it What is it that comes super easy to me that I don't have to practice? And then how can we put that in a bucket and then say, well, what are, what are some things that I, I'm not good at? You guys all know, or some of you guys that know me well know that I play pickleball, I love it. Um, it's, it's, it's a passion of mine. And what I would see people do is that those that could not get a third drop or a third shot drop, which is basically your third shot that you're doing, you'd want to make sure that you drop it in the kitchen. Again, forget about the, the semantics of what I'm saying. The point I'm making is that those people that play that sport that are not good at because they haven't practiced enough to get that shot in, what they would do is they would drive the ball hard instead of doing it softly. And what that would do is it would make the opponent on the other side be able to get it and put it back on their side and they would lose the point. And so I would see that these people that wouldn't do that. And I would say, why do you, why do you drive the ball on the third, on the third shot? You should be dropping it in. And they're like, oh, I'm just, I'm not good at that. And so they would overcompensate because they knew they weren't good at certain things by doing other things that were not productive, that weren't effective, that didn't give them what they wanted. How do we do that in our business? How often are we overcompensating in certain aspect of it by doing something else that's really not effective? 
case in point, how much time do we spend on servicing the transaction, servicing the deal, instead of actually going and producing more transactions for ourselves? You guys, most of you live in an area where if you sold 20 homes, you'd be a rock star, right? Some areas you need to sell 40 or 50 homes to like be good. But most of you guys can do a handful of transactions and, and you know live very comfortably, right? But imagine if you did more, right? I mean, if you're doing five or six deals, if, if the average is four or seven you know, deals per person, I mean, think about it. Like, what are you doing with the, for the rest, with the rest of your time? And if you could hone that energy and say, okay, well, I know I'm really good at this. And I'm going to spend my attention in doing this that, that I'm not good at and make it better. How much more skill set would you have? How much more productive would you be as an agent? And ultimately, what would that mean for your bank account? Does that make sense? Nazar, I loved how she made the point that it wasn't that she had to practice everything every single day, that it was taking those things that she needed to work on. So I think that's very important. Absolutely. Um, you know, ultimately they're like, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm harping the whole role play thing and, and it's not just role play, right? There's lots of different things we can practice, but if you're not spending 20, 30, even an hour every single day role playing and practicing what you're not good at, then you'll never get good at it. You'll always go to your default setting to do the thing that you say that or that naturally comes out of your head and guess what happens? It's not good enough. It's not effective. And you won't get the results you're looking for because you'll be doing the same exact thing, hoping for something else to happen and it won't. You'll get the same exact results as you've always gotten. So in 2023, knowing that there's less transactions that are gonna take place, significantly less transactions, and there's potentially a little bit less agents that you're, you're vying against for the same business, what are you going to do, the person that's sitting in your seat right now, what are they going to do to be able to make sure that they hone their skills, that they upgrade their mindset, that they're feeding their physical body the way it should to conserve them, and they're arming themselves with knowledge and then practicing that over and over and over again? And when you do those things, just like that lady was saying, she spends, I forget what the number was, like over 6,000 hours of practice right? And most agents, what do we do? We practice on our clients because we don't do it enough, right? Like, you know, I think I shared the story like last year when my son started playing soccer again, like he was in, in this little league, right? He's 10 years old and he's playing this in this league. And the only time he would practice was when he was playing a game. And you really quickly could see that the kids that were a part of that team and the other teams that they played against, the ones that were really good were the ones that did it more. It wasn't just the one time I'm going to do this because, you know, I, I get to practice this, but they did it, or excuse me, because this is the game, they practiced when it didn't count. They made the wrong shot or the wrong goal or the wrong move when it didn't matter. But because of that, they were able to change like, oh yeah, you know what? I did that last time. It didn't work. I'm going to, I'm going to change it a little around a little bit and make it better. Even if it's an incremental increase, incremental growth. I promise you, if you guys do that, if you guys really take your business seriously, and guess what? If you don't, you are going to be out of business by the end of this year. Like you will say, you know what? This real estate thing is just not working. I'm going to go ahead and go back to, you know, being a bartender or, or you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll wait for, for the market to come back up and then, then I'll do stuff. And that very well could be. That's already happened to a lot of agents and will continue to happen this year. But if you want to level up, if you want to have the ability to be able to thrive in 2023, then I invite you to level up. I invite you guys to take the necessary stuff to do the hard, right? Because it's hard either way. Either it's hard to do the work that you have to do, to do the things that you, you know you should, that you don't want to do, but you still do them anyway because you want to get the results you want. Or are you going to do the hard, and that is trying to figure out your finances because you have no money? Right? Either you're going to deal with that type of hard or you're going to deal with the hard of, hey, I'm going to do this because it's something that I just need to get done. And I, and I encourage you guys, right? I have faith in you that you will do the right thing, that you will level up. And I think the, the most critical part of all of this is, first of all, committing to doing it. And then two, getting an accountability partner. That could be someone from your office. That could be someone from a different office. 
right? That could be your kids, that could be your spouse, that could be whoever it is that you want that could truly hold you accountable, right? I've got accountability partners for certain things. And guess what? Like when there's a way to be able to track and measure, just like how that lady had, where she's tracking and measuring everything she's doing all the time she's practicing, right? If there's certain things I'm trying to avoid, like sugar, because I'm trying to, you know, get healthier, then I have people that I say, hey, listen, if you see me eat more than I should be eating, then slap my hand or tell me to stop, right? Giving them permission to do that. And with business, it's the same thing. If you're like, hey, if you see me in the office doing nothing, right? Like if you see me freaking watching some stupid lame show on my phone at the office because in my head or my family thinks I'm working, but all I'm doing is just pissing away time, scrolling through social media or whatever it is that you're doing as a time suck, then have someone hold your hand or you know slap your hand and be like, hey, don't do that. And if you guys do those things, right, if you commit to those things we talked about and then have someone hold you accountable, then there's no way that you will not succeed. There's absolutely no way that you'll fail. And it's just that simple. It's just basic, basic principles that you need to implement and do the hard. And I invite you guys to do the hard. All right, I'm over time. I appreciate you guys. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to be able to be here um, to, to present this to you today. I know that 2023 and these you know, unforeseen times or times in which things are, are the, you know, we, it's uncertain that you can create certainty by controlling what you can control and forgetting about the rest. And I promise if you do that, that you'll be successful. Okay, thank you for your time, you guys. Have an amazing and powerful Thursday and have an amazing weekend. Let me know if there's anything else I can do to help you guys out. Okay, bye.